becoming, it is so important that we have these kind of events where we have Holocaust survivors who still remember and can tell their story. I don't know how many years we have left where we can take advantage of a real life Holocaust survivor who's willing to talk and share their story. Uh, it's so important to learn about the devastation that can be caused by intolerance, anti-Semitism, racism, whatever the hatred is. And we still experience these things even today. So it's so important to remember the past so we don't repeat the horrors of the past. So I'm going to turn this over to Ann Arnold. She's the author of the book, which we will have a signing at the end of the event up here on, on the table here. Uh, that's why we left extra room. They won't be speaking for two hours, so it's okay. We will be stopping at 3 o'clock. We'll have question and answers. We'll have the book signing. And I'm going to turn it over to Ann, and she's going to share her father, Mark Schumletter, with his story and her story as well. So give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as I mentioned, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking a little bit just to give you a little bit of background. And then I'm going to turn it over to my father, who's going to tell you highlights of his story. I will tell you we really enjoy the question and answers. We want to hear from you what it is that you want to know. So please, no question is too deep or not deep. Please feel free to ask them whatever you want or myself. We really enjoy that part of it. So as Beverly mentioned, I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, and I really never understood how unusual that was growing up. I just figured, well, doesn't everybody know that? And it wasn't until I was in high school writing a paper to try to get a scholarship for college that I decided to do a questionnaire of my peers. I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey. I figured that the, most people there must know about the Holocaust and what happened. And when I created the questionnaire and asked what I thought was simple questions, who is Hitler, what is the Holocaust, have you ever heard of Auschwitz, those kinds of things, I was shocked that my own peers, a lot of them had no idea. It really shook me to the bone. There's a famous Nazi hunter, his name was Simon Wiesenthal, and he dedicated his life after the Holocaust to hunt down the Nazis. And he would start every one of his statements in America saying that every Jew alive today is a survivor. And I would say that I would take that a step further. You see, Hitler did not just target the Jews. He targeted Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, anybody that was against the Nazi regime. Priests were murdered. So I would argue that Anybody that did not believe in Hitler's ideology is a survivor. Because what would have happened, just like it did in Europe, is when he defeated a nation, the first thing he would have done is told everyone to turn people in. And just like they did all over Europe, people would have turned in those that did not agree. Back when I was in high school, I did a little bit of writing. This was back when I was in my room and didn't really let anybody know that I liked to write, because you know, who wants to know that? And this is a poem that I wrote back then, and I'd like to share it with you. Those of you who feel you are not affected are affected the most. Those of you who feel it did not happen to you will experience it the most. Those of you who don't want to remember will have the most terrifying nightmares. Those of you who think it never happened will live through it again. We hear the statement, never forget. And never forget, for me, has two meanings. The first is, we must never forget what happened. We must tell the stories of the past, not just to hear them, but to learn from them. What are the lessons that we can learn from what happens in the past? But never forget, to me, has a second meaning. We must never forget that there are actually good people in this world. I can't turn the TV on today without hearing about hatred 
and bigotry and intolerance and anti-Semitism. That's all I hear about. But I know through my own experiences and through my father's that it's because there are good people in this world that I'm here today. Let me give you a little bit of background. My father is from a tiny village in Poland called Justa. So if you think of a map of Poland, there's this tiny area down in this corner where there are places like Auschwitz in Belgium. Has anyone ever heard of Auschwitz? Okay. So the reason the concentration camps were put in this part of Poland was because it was such a far out place, there weren't a lot of people, and they didn't think they would be discovered. And if you put a pin in the middle of all of that, that's my dad's village. There were 1,500 people that lived in this village, tiny. 500 of them were Jewish. And it was a very vibrant community. Everybody lived very peacefully together. Of the 500 Jewish people that lived in this village, in 1942, and by the end of the war in 1945, by all accounts, less than 10 of them were still alive. Three of them were my dad, my aunt, and my grandmother. My grandfather was the head of the Jewish community. He was a farmer. He employed a lot of people in the town. He was very good to his workers, which I believe is why a lot of them helped him so much. They lived in a small, modest house. They rented half of it out to the foreman in the, fact, in the fields. The name of the family was the Peabot family, and I tell you that because they were very instrumental in our survival. And we had gone back to Poland for the first time in the early 90s. It was a great trip. I got to see places that my dad had told me stories about. And to be able to go with your father and have him take you up to the attic that you heard that story so many times, and going up the ladder and having him look in there going, that's where it happened, you see, that's where it was. And I saw there was this hay in the attic, and I remember the story that I heard my whole life about how they were hiding in that attic. And one day, my grandmother heard footsteps coming up, and she realized the Germans were coming. And she quickly took my dad and my aunt and buried them under the hay and put her hand over their mouths and said, shh, not a word. Don't move, don't say anything. And when the Germans came into the attic, there was a pitchfork on the side. And the German picked up, the Nazi picked up the pitchfork and started stabbing into the head. Because he figured if someone was in there, he sure would hit him. And I remember my dad telling me that story and what he remembered was the swishing sound that sound of that pitchfork going in and out of the hay. And I remember being there in Poland, seeing this place, it was surreal. I got to meet people that actually had saved him, and they were telling me stories from their perspective. But it wasn't until my second trip back to Poland in 2009 that I truly feel my life changed forever. You see, this tiny village has not had one Jewish person that has lived there since 1945. There was a professor from England whose family had emigrated long before the war, and he was tracing his own genealogy and found himself back at this little town, discovered there was a vibrant Jewish community, and asked if they could reconsecrate the cemetery. The town immediately said, of course, got behind the project, and they found out that my father was still alive and my aunt, and asked us to come to Poland for, the for this ceremony. So we agreed to go. And when we first got there, the first stop we did was in front of the house that he grew up in. And we were just admiring the house, showing my cousin who had never been there, when these people from across the street started coming out of their homes. And they started pointing at my dad. And they're going, we know you. Aren't you the Schoenwetters? And we're all looking at each other like, who knows us here? We're like, yes. They're like, we remember you. We used to play with you when you were a kid. And then they almost started purging their souls to us. And they said, and we remember when they used your house to separate the people. And that one man, and they turned to each other, remember that man? He, he tried to run away. And the Nazi beat him. And this, right here on the street, this is where he laid for three days. And they told us that if we were to help him, 
they would kill us. And we had to wait three days for him to die on the street here. That's how my day started. Needless to say, I'm a crier. I used a lot of tissues that day. So we then proceeded into the center of town where the townspeople had gotten together and they put a plaque on town hall commemorating the fact that there was this community. And this town hall was very significant to me personally because, as I mentioned, my grandfather was the head of the Jewish community. So he was periodically called down to police headquarters by the Nazis because it was his job to keep the Jews in line. At one point, they had been kicked out of their house and they were living in a small one-bedroom little, in someone's home, like a little one-bedroom that they got. And again, one night, there was a knock on the door, and they called my grandfather down, and that was the last time my father ever saw his father. We found out later that my grandfather was taken to this building, to the jail that I was standing in front of. And he was put in jail, and one of his friends was the jail master, or whatever you want to call him, and he opened the gate to the jail cell, and he said, go take a walk. And my grandfather went, and he came back a half hour later. And he said, what are you doing? Do you understand what I'm telling you? Leave, go, get out of here, find your family, escape. They're gonna take you. And he goes, I know exactly what you're saying to me. But I am the head of this community. And I refuse to allow them to use my running as the excuse for why they will kill everybody. I will die with my people. I ask one thing, please, my wife and kids, I know they can survive, please help me. And it was in front of this building that my grandfather had made this last grand stand, that they were erecting a plaque commemorating and acknowledging the fact that he had actually lived there. It was very powerful. And I thought that that was amazing because it was like 20 or 30 townspeople that came out to witness this. I was like, wow, pretty cool, there's a lot of people here. So they then tell us to go follow the road down. We're gonna to go to the cemetery. It was about a five minute walk. It was such a pretty day. I felt like it was in the movies, like the white picket fences with the flower boxes, and we're skipping along like the kids, you know, yeah, 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 let's have fun. And as we turn in the corner, honestly, we all stopped in our tracks. There was a huge tent that was erected in front of the cemetery. Over 600 townspeople had shown up to witness this day. We found out that the town had heard about what was happening. And you see, when the Nazis came through and they destroyed everything in their wake, they had used the stones in the cemetery as masonry work. And the townspeople started going into their own backyards and in their driveways and digging up anything with Jewish lettering and bringing it back to the town anonymously so they could put headstones together. They were covered 33 headstones, one of which was my great-grandfather's. If that wasn't enough, afterward, they put us on buses and took us to the local high school, where these kids and their parents Googled authentic Jewish food and created a buffet for us, 20 feet long. They created a small section for people that were kosher. They started to perform songs in Hebrew to us. Now, I want to remind you, that not one Jewish person has ever lived in this town since 1942. They don't speak anything but Polish. Forget about English. I mean, they, they're, we're so far deep in Poland that the first time I was in Poland, there were still horses and buggies there. And I went up to the mayor afterward, and I said, I want to thank you for what you've done here. And he goes, I don't want your thanks. No thanks are necessary. This was the only thing to do and the right thing to do. And that's when it hit me. The whole day, there was one thought that had been going through my mind. What's in it for them? Because there was no way that they were doing this just because they were good people, right? They had to get money for it, or maybe there was some press involved, right? I mean, like, who, who does this just out of the goodness of their hearts? Because my whole life that I grew up, I kind of knew that because I was Jewish, the people didn't really like me. I knew that my dad was hunted just because he looked different or because he believed in something different. And it, when the mayor said that to me, it sounds totally corny, 
but my life was changed forever. Because I realized that there really is goodness, that there are really good people in this world. And that's why when I came back, I decided it was time to get my dad's story down. I took the next six months, and I started interviewing him every week. He was really annoyed with me. Every week I made him sit down and interview him, and I started a blog. And I really did it for my family. Because a lot of my family didn't really know about what had happened to my dad. I did it for my kids. Years later, it eventually got turned into the book. But now my dad and I, and my sister as well, we're on this mission to go around and to spread that word. To make people understand. We have a choice. We have a choice to either be those people that are going to spread hatred and spread intolerance and spread all that anti-Semitism we have, or I'm choosing to look at the goodness. And I'm hoping that if we can get enough people to choose goodness and peace and tolerance, our voices will eventually be louder than those of hate. It's not by yelling. It's by understanding. I want to leave you with another poem that I wrote, and then I'm going to introduce my father. The question who, the answer me. The question where, the answer here. The question how, the answer within. The question when, the answer now. The question, what? The answer, never forget. With that, I'd like to introduce my father, Mark Schoenmutter. He's going to give you some highlights about his story. And as I mentioned, we'll then open up to questions and answers. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. And I want to thank all of you for being here and listening to my story of survival. Well, you're looking at the most lucky man in this world. Because I survived the Holocaust and I did survive thanks to my mother. She was one of the most bravest women. And she was going through those years hiding and little feeding us, whatever she could feed us with, through all those four, five years during the war. Well, let me tell you, let me start this story when the day that they took my father, when my daughter mentioned, and he came back to the, to the cell, to the prison, that was the last time, last day, that we saw our father. And in the evening, the same evening, the wife of the Polish chief of police in this town came in and she told my mom, listen, I overheard the Germans was, they were talking to my husband and they mentioned to him that in the next couple days or so, they're going to take all the people, all the Jewish people out from the town and I don't know where or what, but that's what they said. So I suggest that you take your kids and try to hide somewhere, escape from the town. My mom says, thank you. And then she sits and she thinks what to do. Well, she decided to take me and my sister, which was younger than me yet. And we went, she took us back to the house that we were told to leave, our own house. And she went to the Polish family that worked for my father, and she comes to Mr. Piwak, and she says, can you give me some idea what to do, because I heard that they're going to eliminate the whole town, so what should I do? 
Well, he says, it's late in the evening. Why don't you leave him here and let him sleep with my kids? And you go to my cousin, and tomorrow morning, I'll bring them in, and I, then we talk and we decide what to do. So I went and I went between the kids, went to sleep. Next morning, early in the morning, the Gestapo is coming, the Polish police is coming, and whoever was in charge goes to Mr. Piwa and he tells him, the Schoenwetters are hiding here. You keeping them here. Show us where they are. And he says, they're not here. So the German looks at him and he says, let me repeat to you. We want to know where they are because we don't want to waste our time and look for them. Because we, if, you, if we're going to find them, you're going to be killed and they're going to be killed. So where are they? So he says, you're welcome to look around and see if you see if they're there or not. So he says to the rest of the Gestapo, go out, look for them. They go out and he is walking out from the room and then he stops, he turns around, he looks around and he approaches the oldest daughter and he says, can you tell me how many brothers and sisters do you have? And she without any hesitation says, eight. So he goes, he counts, eight. So he walks out. So the father says to the kids, up, get up, quick, get dressed, up, get outside, take the horses, cows, and make yourself busy. And he tells me quietly, and you go out with them. However, don't come back to the room anymore. You run into the bushes, hide there, and I will find you. Well, let me just say that that was the first lucky thing that happened to me. That she was smart enough to count me in the amount of brothers and sisters. Well, anyway, he came in, he took me, met my mom, and he recommended to my mom that he's going to take her to a ghetto because he feels that over there people live there are a lot of people in there, and those, he figured that those here at Gestapo won't go to this town and look for you, so you'll be safe there. So let me take you there, and you live there. And that's what he did. We went into the ghetto, and we um, took us and we looked for a location. It was very difficult to find anything because there were a lot of people. All the houses were full with people, not only in the houses, however, people lived on the streets. But my mom got lucky. She found a little space big enough for three people just to be sitting next to each other. And we start living in this ghetto this way. Well, I don't have to say how the conditions were, but they were horrible. There was no food. If you got sick, there was no medicine. Uh, there was no clothes to change. Whatever we walked into the ghetto, there were, those were the clothes, and that's what we were day and night. That was the only thing what we had, and that's what you lived like. Well, my mom got sick. We were sick. We got lice, so my mom shaved us. The only food we were getting 
early in the morning, you had to stay in line. And when you got into the kitchen, you got soup. Call it soup, which was actually warm water with color in it, but no taste even, plus a slice of bread. Then in the late afternoon, by the evening, you were staying in line again, and again the same thing you got. And that was you based the food that you lived in it. Of course, we were skinny and, you know, the bones and skin are not all of us, and, but that's the what was the life in the ghetto. One day, a little boy comes in to my mom and he tells her, listen, there is a gentleman standing outside the fence and he asked me if I can find you. So he says, let me take you and show you where he is. My mom goes and calls them, Mr. Piwat, the same guy who brought us to the ghetto, he's there, and he says to my mom, listen, I heard that they're going to eliminate the ghetto in the next few days, so I, I, I came here to save you. Bring the kids and I tell you what to do. My mom went, she brought two of us, and he says, okay, I know you don't, you're not, you don't look the most strongest woman in the world, and those little kids don't, don't look too fat because they have only skin and bone. So what I want you to do, pick each one at a time, throw them over the fence, and I catch them on the other side. Then you climb on the, on the wires, you put a blanket on top of the barbed wire, and just jump over, and I catch you here. And that's what we did. And then he says, okay, you look horrible in those clothes. I knew you don't have any clothes. But this is the house here. I made arrangements with the people. I take you inside. You have to change the clothes, throw everything out. And then we're going to leave the town. And that's what we did. And he took us to a village, to a house, which was standing right next to a forest. And he told the lady, those are the people who I mentioned to you and asked you to take him in and hide him. So she says, okay. Tells to my mom, you go on the edit, take the kids, cover yourself with hay there, and make sure that those two little kids, they don't talk, they don't cry, they don't laugh, no sound of them, because we don't want anybody to hear that you hear, because you know the consequences. What would happen if somebody would find out that you hide it here? And that's, we went in and we lived in this house for a winter. When the summer came in, the lady says, I'm sorry, but you have to leave because people are, farmers are coming out, they're working in the fields, they be moving back and forth around the houses here, they may notice you, so I am afraid. I'm sorry, you have to go. So my mom says, well, okay, but have an idea where to go, what to do, not really. But what I can suggest to you, why don't you take your kids Go into the forest, it's a very, very big forest. Go to the forest, find yourself a place between the bushes under the trees. It's summertime and live there. Well, that's what mom did. She took us, we went to the forest and we started living in this forest. And of course my mom was teaching us to distinguish the sounds from the animals running around, or how it would be sounding if a person would walk, so we can distinguish and be careful and watch for anything there. And that's how we lived through the summer. When winter came in, 
Well, you cannot sit in forest because it's raining, I mean snowing, cold. Well, my mom took us and again, she, walked, she went to different villages, people that she knew a, a little bit or she knew about some of the people and she kind of felt comfortable to go into their house and ask them to take us in. Well, some people said yes, some people said no. And again, my mom, when somebody was very, uh, not anxious, but favorable to take her in and said, okay, yes, 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 come in, come in, come in. She says, okay, let me go out and I get the kids and I be back. She never went to back to this house. However, when she went to her family, and they were saying, well, I would love to help you. I feel sorry for you and your little kids, but you know, we scared. If they, the Germans would find out, we'd be in trouble all. I'm sorry. So then my mom started begging. So after a few you know, minutes of begging and, and crying, Usually those people take mom and they go, okay, I take you for a week. Then you have to go and find yourself another place. Well, at least we had a week in mind. But then, when we were then week, this one week usually became a month or six weeks. But then mom had to leave. And again, the same routine to look for another place. And when we got lucky, we we got the location to stay. And again, when the summer came in, we had to leave, and where we went, back to the same forest, and live in the forest. And when we started living in this forest, one, at one point, we came across about 20 plus people, Jewish people, who were hiding in the forest. It happened to be that when Mark met him, she noticed there are two cousins of ours were there and they talked and they were so happy to see each other. So the people say, why don't you stay with us? Don't go back wherever you are, just stay with us. And my mom says, no, I'm not going to stay. It's too big of a group. It's very easy to be spotted. If somebody passes by day or night, whenever he's going to see and then, you know, it's no good. So I'm going back. So they kind of argued, uh, but my mom took us and we went back to our location. Well, a couple days later, the two cousins came and they said, why don't you join us? It's so much easier for you to be with a group of people. Here by yourself, you don't have even food you don't have anything. We have a little bit here. Because we are bigger group, we're handling this better. She says, no, no, no. So then they decide, okay. They came back and they said, we're going to stay with you and help you out with the kids. And that. you cannot be by yourself. Anyway, not long after that, we hear shots. And what we hear, machine guns. And when we heard machine gun, we knew those are Germans, not Polish police. <coughs> so let's run, because they, were, they sounded so close where we were. Let's run away. So where you run? Forward. Mom stops them and says, no, we're not going to run forward. We're going to try to go and sneak around behind them where they were already, because if they're going to go forward, they're going to know there's a place, they're going to know that other people are here. What are they going to do? They're going to continue going to, and we're not going to be able to escape. So that's what she did. She took us, and then they follow us. We sneak through the, through the Germans in the back, went to a different part of a forest. We were sitting there for a whole day. <coughs> Then, late afternoon, quiet everything, we went back to the location 
Well, when we came back and looked at the location where they were, what we found, only dead bodies. Mm -hmm. Everybody was <coughs> So again, thanks to my mom, we went through another, many other, call it miracles at that time. Well, winter is coming again, so we want to be separated from them and looking for a place. We came to a location, and the Polish gentleman says, well, I will take you in, however, I have to think where I can put you so it will be safe for everybody. So give me a few days, two, three days, and come back and let me figure out what to do. All right, I couldn't wait too long, but she was anxious, but she was waiting the two, three days. Came back to the location, and he says, okay, let me show you what I think, what I would like you to stay. If you want it, <coughs> you stay. So he takes us in to a big sty. And he shows us that he did a hole under the, in the ground, and the hole big enough for about three people, just be one next to each other. Maybe this high, you couldn't sit even. Just lay in it. And he says, if you want it, that's the place where you're going to hide. And I'm, I'm okay. I will, I take it, I be, thank you. So he says, okay, go in, lay down, we did. He takes pieces of wood, covers the whole thing on top, puts hay on top of the pieces of wood, brings the pig inside that, and here the pig is on top, <coughs> we are on the bottom, and that's how we were living through another winter, hiding in this hole. Yes, occasionally, like in every few weeks, we took the pig out, picked a couple pieces of wood, told us, get out for a few minutes, breathe a little bit fresh air, straighten out your body, and then go back in. And here we go again, and we lived like that. Well, after we went through this winter, then we went back to the forest. However, we couldn't stay too long in the forest because the front, the German front, it was in the Russians were coming closer and closer, and we saw the Germans, you know, with tanks or artillery moving back and forth through the forest, and they were shooting. So. My mom, we cannot stay here, so where to go? But what do we see? What mom sees is Polish people, refugees, escaping the fighting from the front, going deeper into the German side. So what mom did, she told, she took us, and she told us, okay, your name in Polish is this, your name is this, she gave us names, and she told us when you, when we be lucky and somebody will take us, you don't talk much, don't say anything. You, you small kids, you don't have to talk. Just follow whatever it is there. And she start explaining to us the procedure, how people live in a Polish house. Finally, we were lucky enough that a Polish family took us in, we took another two families in, and we live in this house. Well, we did, you know, going through the uh, 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 style of life of Polish people because, you know, in the morning, breakfast, everybody sits down, is doing the prayer, is crossing himself. Sunday comes, everybody goes to the church. So we will have to be <coughs> careful, you know, what's going on. And people are getting a little bit suspicious. 
a woman with two little kids. And they ask her, where is your husband? Why are you only with the two little kids? So my mom found the excuse. Well, in my village, the Germans came in. They took all the men to walk to the front line. And then when the front was so close already, we had to escape because everybody was escaping. So we escaped, and I don't know what happened to my husband. He's just <coughs> probably working just someplace but for the Germans. Well, she told him the story, but they weren't, you know, too, 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 too convinced that that's the truth. Well, one day, on a Sunday, everybody goes to a confession to the church. Well, we have to go to the church to the confession. My mom didn't have ex. <laughs> I'm sorry to say experience in it, what to do and how to proceed there. So when her turn, her turn, turn comes and goes right in front of the little window where the priest is sitting on the other side, she comes in, she sits down, and she says, Father, I, am, I, I, I came here to confession and I know when you do the confession, you have to tell the truth. So let me tell you the truth. I am Jewish. I am here with two little kids. And I'm trying to survive the war. There is nothing else I can tell you. It's you the priest. So I am telling you the truth. So he looks at her and he says, listen, my child, you're a brave woman. You survived so far. And I am sure that you will survive. It's very close to the end of the world. You'll be soon liberated the way it looks like. So just go out and continue doing what you do, because you're doing very well. God bless you. My mom got up, walked out. All the people standing when she outside the church already. And he comes out, and he goes to my mom. He puts his hand over her shoulder, and makes believe he's talking something to her. And the people saw, well, priest is so nice to her and talks to her, then our suspicions, whatever she is, were wrong. And she was accepted as part of the whole thing, and that's how it was another, call it miracle that we, thanks to my mom, continue living. Well, anyway, soon after that, 1945, in the beginning, like February or something, everything quiet down, no shooting, no fighting, quiet for a week or so, no movement of any armies, we didn't see anything. Then all of a sudden we see some soldiers walking. We didn't know who the soldiers are, because they had different uniforms, not German, but when they came to the house, they start talking, but of course nobody understood because they were speaking Russian. But some of them knew a little Polish, and they say, you liberated, you free, you can go home. Don't be afraid anymore. There is no Germans here anymore. Just go home, you free. And that's how we were liberated and the war for us was not the end of the war yet, but for us, this was the end of the war. So let me stop here and open to questions, and I'd be more than happy to share with you any kind of questions in reference to any of those situations, to, or whatever you have on mind you want to ask me. I'd be more than happy to give you an answer.
Thank you so much for this. I'm one of the teachers here, so I'm pretty brave because I'm used to speaking in front of people. Um, when you talk about this time frame, when exactly was it that the Germans came to the village in Poland to the time that you were liberated in 45? I di wasn't clear on so if you told us the year. In 1939, when the Germans invaded Poland, a few months after that, they entered the village. They were there occupying it, and in 1942 is when they rounded up and exterminated all the Jews in that village. So he was actually hiding from 1942 to 1945 for three years. Yes? How old was he when that took place? Old. Um, when he started hiding, was nine. He was, from the time he was nine through 12 was when he was hiding. He was about six when the war started. I was just wondering, um, whenever you were living in the pigsty, um, how often were you eating? In the pigsty, how often were you eating? Well, when he made the room for us in the pigsty, he made a little hole on the side so he could take, let's say, uh, just pass by uh, a little something. So he used to give us occasionally soup, or piece of bread. Every day or every two days, we used to get something to eat. Just a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what was your mom's name? His mother's name was Sala. Sala. She was smart. She was very smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there was, a, was there a question on this side? Or, oh, right over there in the back row. And <coughs> Sorry, how'd you get around um, language-wise? Because well, in Poland, everyone was speaking Polish. Oh, okay. And he was, he was in Poland the whole time. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yes. I was just wondering with the pigsty thing, because he mentioned that uh, they would be let out from that hole that they were in, uh, like, uh, after a week or so, just to clean it out, whatsoever, to get fresh air. What about uh, doing your necessities, like a team and stuff like that? Of course, it's like... So, Dad, when you were in the pigsty, how did you, what if you had to go to the bathroom? What if you had to do things? What did you have to do? We did that everything down there, <laughs> and we lived with it. They just we had just to live in it. They moved a little bit, shoved ourselves into a little corner, and, and we kept everything there because there was no other choice. And with the pig being on top, the smell, everyone It was the same was thing, of course. I don't know which one was worse. <laughs> <laughs> How did your sister like, handle this inside of like, How did his sister handle it? How did your sister handle all of this? Well, basic, sorry, basically, more or less the same. The only thing, she, because she was a little younger than me, <coughs> So she was more trying to cry or say something, but also my mom was making sure that she be quiet and the minute she start crying or something, she tried to find a, some kind of a story, make her feel comfortable in promising her who knows what. So she quieted down and it was okay. It was difficult. It was harder, my, I know my aunt, and my dad said was younger, and through researching for the book, she actually at one point, my grandmother had to try to send her away because she was causing too much of her. She was too loud, and it didn't last very long. It was not a very good situation, and they got her back, and unfortunately, she got so traumatized that she never cried again after that, but it was not easy. Yes? How did you manage to eat in the forest? To eat in the forest? Yeah. How did you eat in the forest? Well, in the forest, my mom used to take us and look around and look for wild mushrooms, berries, or anything else that look for her that we can eat and not to get poisoned from. And basically, that was the food for us, what we ate. Occasionally, this Mr. Pewat who took us out and used to come in, and bring us a loaf of bread, or sometimes, if he was lucky, to bring us two loaves of bread. So we had additional 
a little bread and we were slicing it thin and take a little bit at a time so it would last us much, much longer. And that's what we basically ate. When you were in the forest, did you build fires or were you afraid that the smoke would get you seen? Well, yeah, oh, very rare we build a fire. Number one, we need matches or something to start it. Number two, the only time if we did already something, we made sure that we were going and my mom was looking for pieces of, call it wood or, or the branches, that they are very, very dry. So if they were very, very dry, then we start the fire because you didn't have much of a smoke coming up, just the fire itself. But very rarely did this. Yes. Did you? Did your mother ever make contact with the with the gentleman that that saved them from or saved you from from the ghetto? Did you ever keep in touch or make contact with the people that saved you from the ghetto? The Pewa family. Oh, definitely. My mom was in after the war. My mom was constantly in touch with them, and as a matter of fact. She promised him that if she survives, we had a little house next to our regular house where we live. And she promised to give him this house. And after we survived after the war, she went and she gave this family this little house in appreciation and thank him for all the things that he did to us. And then she was constantly in touch for the years with the family. We went back again to Poland a couple years ago. I took my younger daughter with us. And we went back and Mr. Piwat's grandson now lives on the property with that house, where the house was that we gave. And we met him. And it was amazing to me because the house that was originally there has long been torn down. It's, it was an old house. And they built a new house. And he was showing us how there is a piece of the wall of the original house that he has saved. And he's making it into this whole shrine-like thing with the ponds in front of it, because he said that the story is as much theirs as it is ours, and he wants his family to remember what they always did and how the story affected their lives as well. And he kept this piece of the house as a symbolism like that. So it was pretty cool when I saw that. Was there ever a point where you lost hope or survival? Did you ever lose hope for survival? Uh, honestly, I don't think me or my sister, being so young, realized of the circumstances. We did know how horrible it is to live under those circumstances. But we didn't understand exactly what's going on, why this is happening. We didn't have the knowledge of this. So we complained to my mom constantly. We hungry, we dirty, we wet. Why? How long? And she always found the excuse to give us hope. Always the positive way she was looking and promised us Okay, you just wait another few days. You see it's going to be better. So we live under this, you know, way of thinking. And, and that was our hope, her explanations, and, 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 and looking, you know, explaining. That was, that was our hope. I don't know if it's correct answer, but <laughs> that's what it was. Yes. Um, where did you go after the war? Did you, um, where did you live after the war? And then um, after, um, when did you come to the United States? Where did you live after the war? Where did you live? And then when did you come to the, how did you get to the United States? Well, after the war for us ended, we still lived for maybe a week in this Polish family house with other people. And then, mom says, okay, let's go back home. Where else are you going to go? You go back home. Mm -hmm. 
So we went back to our little village, went to our house, and our house was a little damaged because the war was going through, the front was going through this village. There were not many people back yet, Polish people we're talking, who escaped the front lines. So we lived there for about a week or so, and then we went to a larger town. So we went there and we lived in this town from 1945 after the whole thing. We lived in Poland till 1957. Mm -hmm. So we lived quite a few years under the communist regime in Poland. Mm -hmm. And then in 1957, there was a little change in the Polish Communist Party. And usually the head of the Communist Party was also the president of the nation. And he was a little bit more, uh, call it liberal for those times. And he announced that all the Jews, he would uh, let them go out from Poland if they can pass their criteria, whatever it was, and get permission in 30 days. Whoever gets permission in 30 days can leave Poland and go and go to only one country, which was Israel. So we left Poland and we went to Israel. And I left Israel in 1961 and came to the United States. My mother and my sister kept living in Israel. Mm -hmm. And my sister still lives in Israel. But my mom, thanks, you know, God, she lived till 94. And she lived and she passed away about 15 years ago. Did you ever find out what happened to your father? Yes, we did. So let me give you a quick story about how did we find out. Why we were hiding in the forest, and I mentioned that the Mr. Piwa used to came up, come occasionally and bring us a, some food, bread, and if he couldn't make it, he sent his son in law. So one day his son in law comes in, and my mom looks and she says, can you tell me where you got those shoes? And he looks, what shoes? So you know, those shoes that you wear. Can you tell me where you got those shoes? So he said, you don't want to know. Yeah, I do, my mom says. You, you're not going to like the, 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 what I tell you. She says, I know I won't, but I want to know anyway. So tell me, so here he is. When all the, before, the day before they took all the Jews, they came in and they told us, Polish guys, young Polish guys, to go on a truck, the, they have, we have to take you to work. So we went on the truck and they took us to the forest. When they brought us to the forest, they gave us shovels and they told us, dig, big, big hole, dig a hole. So we went and we worked all day and we did this big, big, tremendously big hole. Two days later, they came back to town and they told us, get on the trucks, you go back to work. So we went and when they bringing us, they brought us back to the forest. When we got off the trucks and go to the hall, this hall is full with dead bodies. Full with dead bodies. They gave us again shovels and they told us, cover this whole thing up good. We did. Then they say to us, well, you're allowed to take one item for the work that you did. You see all the, all the things um, line up on the side here? 
what was it? When they took all these people, they told them to strip and line up all the clothes and all the belongings, whatever they had on the side. And then they line them up in front of this hall, machine guns be prepared and PPT and everybody there. So he says, I was looking around, what to take. Then all of a sudden I see your husband's shoes. I recognize him. So for memory, I took the shoes. So that's how we found out that my dad was killed and he was in this big grave in there. In 2011, the grave was actually discovered. Again, a good person, anonymously, must have been more than one because it was pretty heavy. There was a couple people that came back and put a grave marker at the grave site. It was discovered in 2011 when someone was hiking in the woods and saw something from the leaves and when they brushed it apart and dug it up, they found this grave marker that says this is where you know, on August 12, 1942, 500, we listed the whole thing. So they made this, the town went and made it into a whole memorial area. And he went back for the ceremony and we went back. It's pretty far deep in the woods. So we need to hike up there. It's a good 15 minute hike from the road. And there's all we were able to find out where the best area was. If anybody needs to leave to get to your class, 